German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Hegel once said that the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. <laughs> In other words, I think he's trying to say we don't learn anything by our mistakes. You know, if we learned anything from history, we would probably not keep making the same old mistakes that we do. It's ironic, I think, that in a few days' time, uh, the Jewish nation will be celebrating the Feast of Purim. Just in case you don't know what the Feast of Purim is, it's a feast to celebrate the deliverance of the Jewish nation uh, from total annihilation two and a half thousand years ago. And this plot was concocted by a lunatic by the name of Haman, who was the Prime Minister of Persia back in those days, two and a half thousand years ago. And that's what this feast is celebrating, that God rescued them uh, by the hands of uh, Esther. Uh, you can read it in the book of Esther, it's quite an interesting story. And uh, ever since the Jews have celebrated this feast and their deliverance from this uh, attack against them. So, during this coming Purim celebration, I know that Israel must be very acutely aware that two and a half thousand years later, after this event which they celebrate, another Persian, this time a president, is currently seeking to do the same thing, which is to annihilate them. What Haman planned for the Jews two and a half thousand years ago is exactly what uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is planning to do to them sometime in the future. This is kind of ironic, I think. Do you agree? <laughs> History doesn't change much, does it? Persia, now called Iran of course, is playing out in front of our eyes an ancient biblical story. But now in modern days, and apart from some Christians, and obviously the Jewish people, who in the political world has joined the dots together? Very few, I suspect, if any. The only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. If Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, that's a difficult word to say, if he'd have learned anything at all from his own Persian history, he may not want to carry on with his plans. Because the story goes that God rescued Israel and instead Haman perished. And if Ahmadinejad knew that, he may not want to go through with, it, with those plans. You know, I was under the impression that replacement theology, and I'll explain this to you in a moment, that replacement theology had died a death in May of 1948. That's when Israel was reborn as a nation. And I thought that uh, replacement theology had died a death at that point, but apparently not. Just in case you don't know what replacement theology is, it means that the Jews no longer play uh, a central role or any kind of a role in God's plans. That that place has been taken over by the Christian Church. A simple understanding of Scripture clearly states that this isn't true. The Church, obviously, is the Bride of Christ, and you can't get a much higher status than that. However, there are certain promises that God made to Abraham that have not yet been fulfilled. And God being a God who always keeps his promises will fulfill those remaining prophecies to Israel. And so therefore Israel still has a role to play in God's plans. I think most of us agree with this, except for those who believe in replacement theology. They feel that the Jews no longer have any part to play in God's plans. This last week, beginning from Monday the 5th of March through to Friday the 9th of March, 
About 30, 30 Christian leaders held a conference at the Bethlehem Bible College in Israel. Many of these people are very well-known evangelicals. They won't be meeting, all of these are members of this replacement theology, but they will not be meeting under the name of replacement theology. Instead, they will be using the term Palestinian liberation theology. And their main theme will be to say, uh, the theme of the meetings will be that Jerusalem doesn't belong to the Jews anymore, that it belongs to all the nations of the world. And their argument would come from uh, a scripture such as the one I'm going to give you now. They may not use this one, but it's such as this one. And I'm going to quote to you from Jeremiah uh, chapter 3 and verse 17, which says that at that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honour the name of the Lord. Now, quite clearly, this scripture applies uh, to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when he comes back to this earth and reigns for 1,000 years. It's not applied before that. I have a sermon on this subject on the audio page of the website. For those who might be interested in this subject, uh, go and listen to this sermon on the audio page. The sermon is called Replacement Theology. It might help you to understand it better, I don't know. But my problem with all this is this, that if God's promises to Israel no longer apply, then God is not a keeper of his promises, such as we have believed that he is. So if, for example, Ezekiel 36 doesn't mean a thing anymore, if it's irrelevant for today, wow, that could be dangerous. Because all the Old Testament promises of Israel, if they are null and void, means that God has changed his mind. Well, stop and think about this, folks. If God has gone back on his word to the Jews, how can we be sure that he won't go back on his word to the Christians? Terrible thought. So if, if Ezekiel 36 no longer is applicable, how can we be sure that John 3.16 is applicable anymore? worth thinking about. It's my understanding from Scripture that if I personally suffer with Christ, I will also reign with him, and the same applies to you, of course. It's, it's my belief that if I believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, my sins are forgiven forever, and I will inherit eternal life. This is my understanding of Scripture. As I understand it, when I die, he will raise me from the dead. Fair enough. And these kind of beliefs, and a lot more, are some of the beliefs that we as Christians believe. We have these beliefs. So therefore, if we dismiss the promises made to the Jewish people, then we need to consider whether or not we can trust God to keep his promises to us, or whether he might just go back on them. You know, it's so very important that we know what we believe about God and about God's promises. What do we think about the Bible? How much of the Bible are we going to take as being genuine, and how much are we going to just throw away? You know, if, we, if, if any of it is wrong, the whole lot is wrong. The evolutionist says one thing. God's Word says something entirely different. Who are we going to believe, the evolutionist or the Bible? Our government tells us that Christian morality has changed with the times. But God's words say something entirely different. Who are we going to believe? If you want to hear more about this theme, then why not listen to my sermon uh, on the audio page. Also, I want to remind you, if you have not signed the petition on the website, uh, if you go to the page uh, or the section, uh, look at our world, and then go onto the UK page, right at the bottom you'll see the petition. If you haven't already signed it, why not sign it? If you believe that God's promises are forever, 
then go and sign that petition. God bless you all. Have a great week. Bye for now. I left my father's throne above To show you perfect love, oh my child I did this all for you I had the clothes torn